Well, good morning, everyone. Why don't you guys get up and greet one another? Why don't you stand up and say hello to each other? Well, it's good to see you all this morning. As you can see, yesterday we had a uh, we had an emergency funeral here yesterday uh, for Mark Mokarski. And uh, it's an amazing thing what God will do to get people in church. He'll even let a tornado touch down on Route 35 and break off some poles and cut the power off to the funeral parlor. And suddenly everybody had to come to the church and they had to hear a message. You know, you just got to get used to some of these things. <laughs> well, I want to let you know that next week here at Grace, we're going to have some baptisms. We have some folks that are going to commit their life to Jesus Christ publicly with a profession and also a testimony and being baptized in water. We have bought a special pool. So we don't have to go down to the beach in the freezing cold water and Pastor Dave doesn't have to feel uncomfortable because <laughs> it's all about me. It's actually going to be right here on our front lawn and we're going to do it after church next week. So you guys can be prepared, invite some visitors and uh, we'll, we'll have uh, the people that are going to be baptized give their testimony. So that'll be an exciting thing for next week. With that, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here, that you've given us a day to recognize you, a day when most of us don't have to go to work, a day when we have the opportunity to be in a safe, cool place to learn about you. And so, Lord, we sit at your feet, as it were, and we look for you to speak to us from your word. And as we look at the historical documents, as we look at the spiritual documents, we pray that you might make us living epistles as we leave, that you would help us to take your word, your disclosed will, and that you'd help us to apply it to our lives. I thank you for my friend Mark who we remembered yesterday. I pray that you might help all of us to deal with this loss as we look to you. So Lord, we give you this time and we pray that you help us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are back in the book of Luke today. We're in chapter 22. And um, I thought for sure that I was gonna get through all 72 verses today. <laughs> But no, no, it's not going to happen. And we'll see how far, I'm not even sure we'll get as far as I planned, but you gotta try, right? Well, maybe one of you would like to try. That'd be, I'm just kidding. I'm in pain today, my back is killing me. Any of you have that going on? I just feel, I feel old. So forgive me for being old. You're old too, Steve. I don't know what you... <laughs> you know how when somebody's on death row and they're um, supposed to go to their death, they actually get a last meal? It's a real deal. And it's interesting because we're going to look at Jesus' last meal. And he's actually going to be killed very soon. And he knows this. And so he gathers with his disciples. And what he did was practice the Passover. But he changed it. And he brought new light to it. And so as we go through it, we're going to look at that. He says here in chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, that he took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, 
which is shed for you. So we're going to talk about communion, even though it's not the first of the month, which is when we typically take communion. And we're going to look at what Jesus teaches. Just so that you know, we're approaching the cross. This is the week of unleavened bread when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he's heading towards the cross. Last week, we looked at the final countdown as Jesus was headed towards the cross and he begins talking about how Jerusalem is going to come tumbling down and there will not be one stone left upon another. And he gives prophecy about the near coming destruction of Jerusalem and then he gives prophecy about the future of what's coming. When there will be signs in the heavens and the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth and the distress of nations and all of that which we are kind of coming upon and we're beginning to see in our world, we're going to ultimately uh, see those things unfold in the heavens, as Jesus said. And he says, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape. How many of you want to be counted worthy to escape? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the way of escape. So this week, as you know, we're talking about Jesus' last meal, talking about the Last Supper or communion, as we call it, or the Passover meal, if you're familiar with that. It begins in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. An interesting two verses. The Passover is drawing near, and the religious rulers are plotting a murder. It just kind of smacks you in the face when you read that. The Passover, this most sacred event, this time of fasting, uh, well, you're not really fasting, but you're eating unleavened bread for a week to remember the Passover, that coupled with, we need to figure out how to kill this guy. And it's interesting because they're getting ready to sacrifice a lamb as well and to remember, and their plotting is murder. Well, the Passover is all about, if you go back into Exodus, when Moses was selected by God to be his instrument to take the people of Israel out of Egypt. And as they were going out, if you remember all of the 10 plagues that came upon Egypt and everything that occurred, you know, the lice, the frogs, and uh, we could go through the 10 and their significance to each one of those, the Nile turning the blood and the, the hailstones, all of that. There is significance to all of that, but I don't want to get too sidetracked because we have 72 verses to do. Eventually, Pharaoh lets go. He hardens his heart, he hardens his heart, and then God hardens his heart, and then he hardens his heart. And God's working in coupling with his will and hardening his heart because he's got a certain amount of things that need to occur, and he wants to show himself in a certain way. And eventually, he says, take everybody and get out of here. And if you, let, if you remember the last plague, it was the death of the firstborn. There's significance to that because if you remember, Jesus is considered the firstborn of God. And it's not unusual that these terms are used, that Jesus is picking up Old Testament inferences about himself. And so you were to apply blood from a lamb, you were to sacrifice it, and if you had more than enough for your family, you had to invite other families into your house so that it would all get eaten. There's no leftovers. Uh, so that, that's good, no Tupperware necessary. You eat all the leftovers and you make sure, and, you, and it's a community thing that you do together to remember what happens. And they did at one time put the blood up on the lintel and on the doorposts. And of course, when you put blood up on top of a doorpost, you know you're going to get it on you and drip on the floor and all that. And, and on the doorposts, and it makes the symbol of a cross of the places where Jesus himself was bleeding. If you remember upon his brow, the thorns that they pressed there. And if you remember his hands as they were driven in to the wood and his feet as they were driven in, you have this incredible Old Testament prophetic picture of Jesus on a cross. And because of that, death passes over us and we have eternal life. And so they're practicing the Passover, the Jews are practicing the Passover, and Jesus is trying to tell them what it's really all about and why it was created 
and it was created to point to him, just like everything else. And of course, they remember that Moses went through the desert with the people, and uh, well, they went up against the Red Sea, first of all, and of course, they thought that was the end. They were pinned up against the, the water, and the Lord shows up in a pillar of fire and of smoke, and he defends them until the waters parted, and they crossed over like they were walking on dry land, and God delivered the people of Israel. And so the Passover is commemorating this withdrawal from slavery into freedom and into God's calling. And so this is a time of expectation in Jerusalem where there are literally millions of people jamming into this city, taking the pilgrimage and celebrating the Passover around the temple. And so that's what we're talking about at this time. And of course, we understand it as communion, which is our common union in Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that with, you know, these little sterile cups and, and saucers, you know, little, little bitty, little bitty, bitty piece of bread. Uh, if anybody on a diet, you, you could eat that. It's okay. But we remember the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's, we call it communion, which is our common union that we all share. And so that's how it's kind of transgressed, but we don't, or, or how it's uh, translated, but we didn't create this. It's actually been taken from the Passover. So just so that you're familiar with the, the these are the seven feasts, actually. There's one more, which is Hanukkah, which is not here, but, uh, and it's actually alluded to one time in the scriptures. Uh, some of you scholarly people, I'll let you try to find it. But anyway, there are the festivals which relate to the coming of Christ. The first coming of Christ is the first four festivals. The spring feast, Passover is number one that you see here on the list, and the Feast of Unleavened Breads and First Fruits. So they're all kind of clumped together. And then 50 days after that, you have Pentecost, which is celebrated. Uh, that's why it's called Pentecost, because it's 50 days later. And then there's a space. And then you'll see the last feasts, are, which are associated with Jesus' second coming, which is trumpets, not unusual, because we're going to hear the trump of God, are we not? And the Day of Atonement, which is associated with Christ coming back in his second coming, because we'll finally go home. And then tabernacles, which is associated with the millennium and actually uh, coming home and going to heaven. So all of these things, boy, I'd love to go into them deeper, but I have verses. So these are, these are the festivals that we're looking at. Verse 3, and then Satan entered Judas. Somebody should make a movie about that. Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the 12. And so he went his way and he conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and they agreed to give him money. And so he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. You see, the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus, but they didn't want to do it in full view of the people because they were worried about the crowds because the crowds listened to Jesus gladly because he wasn't like the Pharisees. He wasn't busy telling them, you know, you better do this and you better watch out and you better not cry, you better not pout, <laughs> telling you why. You know, he didn't give them that line. He was busy teaching them about God's word and about who God is and about how gracious and loving God is. And all he really wants is relationship. And so the, the common people heard him gladly, the scripture says. But the Pharisees were feeling a little jealous because they didn't have all the limelight and all the attention anymore. Jesus did. And so for that, they wanted to kill him. It's amazing. It's like when somebody tells you the truth, but you don't want to hear it. I'm sure you've never experienced that. But Satan enters Judas. That's kind of a very interesting thing. What does it mean for Satan to enter a person. And of course, Hollywood is just rife with all sorts of movies about people that are possessed. And I don't know if you've seen any, I don't want to bring contra memories for you, but I, I've seen a number of them and none of them are real. It's an exaggeration and it's, it's fueled by imagination. And unfortunately we read the scripture through lenses of things that we've read and experienced and seen. And uh, that's what we think. Basically, the devil himself, notice it wasn't a demon, it was the devil himself, is now inspiring Judas to do what he does. 
Now, there are people, and if you go online, if you do some research, you'll find, you know, 12 people with 18 opinions about how Judas didn't really mean to turn Jesus in. It was a really well-meaning thing where Judas was just trying to get Jesus to take the throne, but he seemed unwilling, so he's trying to push him into it. You're not buying that? No. All right, I don't buy it either. But anyway, there, there are 18 other opinions I could tell you. But Judas was inspired by Satan to do the things that he did. The funny thing is, he's one of the 12 Jesus says, haven't I chosen you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? A devil? I want you to know that Jesus is in control of everything at all times. He's even in control of his crucifixion. He picks the very person who's going to turn him in. He picks him, knowing what he's going to do. Would you do that? Not only that, he shows him grace and makes him the treasurer. He has exclusive control over the money for all of the disciples and him to get food, you know, distribute to the poor. He is the guy who's in control. Think of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ extended to Judas. He travels with him for a, probably about three years. But I find it unusual there is not a specific calling of Judas in the scripture. You will not see Jesus walked up like he did to Matthew. Jesus walked up like he did to Peter and James and John. You won't see that Jesus walks up and he calls them. But he did choose Judas. I find that interesting. And it says that he went to the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him. And they were so glad. They were like, how are we going to get Jesus? Uh, we're going to have to do it after the Passover because we can't do, do, do the Passover. There are too many people here and there would be a riot. So they're trying to figure out how to do it. And they finally have somebody on the inside. They've got Judas. John 12 verses 4 to 6 says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said... Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box. I would put in parentheses that Jesus gave him. And he used to take what was put into it. This was the event that caused Judas to run to them and say, what do I have to do to turn this guy into you? He wasn't a womanizer. He wasn't a drug addict. He didn't have any other besetting sin, but he had one, greed. He just had one fatal flaw. He was greedy. I don't know. Maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you struggle with, you know, I got to figure out how to make a million dollars. I got to figure out, I got I to gotta play the lottery. Maybe God will give me the numbers. Greed displays itself in lots of ways. I've, I've met people who are homeless who are greedy, and they've got nothing. And if they had everything, they'd be just as greedy. Because it's a condition of the heart, not a condition of your finances. So Judas holds the box. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith even in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. <laughs> Notice money is not the root of all evil. It is the root of all kinds of evil. There's, I, I think pride is probably a, a greater root, but money is a problem for people in the church. So what he said, some have lost their faith due to greediness. And so, wow, that's a problem. So I think that might be something for us to remember. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's not having money that's the problem, and it's not the lack of money that's the problem. It's the love of money. It's, that's the thing I need because it represents power and freedom and everything that I really desire in my life, where the opposite of that is to be content. 
content that God is in control and if, and if he wanted me to be rich, I'd be rich, but he knows better. Judas had one problem, it was money. If you notice, Judas falls into a category with Balaam. If you remember, he was considered a prophet of God and he was somebody who actually spoke prophecies in the Old Testament. In fact, he prophesied about the coming Christ who would come. And this guy was as twisted as they could be because he was greedy. He went to the Lord after he was asked to curse the people of Israel. He says, hey, these guys want me to curse these people. And he goes, I don't want you to curse those people. They're my people. Go back and tell them no. He said, okay. Condensed Jersey version. He went back and said, no, I can't do that. The Lord told me I can't. And they go, oh, you want more money. And so they sent other people and they sent more money. In it. And so he said, well, I'll get a second opinion. You know, when God told you to do something the first time, you meant it. But he wanted a second opinion. So he goes back for a second opinion. And the Lord said, yeah, go ahead. Oh, good. He said, I could. But you're only going to say what I put in your mouth. And he speaks over these people and he speaks this incredible blessing. And the guys go, what are you out of your mind? I told you to curse him. He goes, well, maybe we need another location. And they find another location and he tries again. It doesn't work. But what he does is he gives them some very, very evil advice. He says, listen, you don't need me to curse these people. I'm going to give you advice and hopefully you'll pay me for it. Send your beautiful women down there. Have them dress in something low cut, a little high on the thigh, and seduce these Jewish young men. And when that happens and they intermarry and begin to have relationships, God will curse the people. Don't you worry about it because they're in sin. And that's exactly what happened. And he did it for money. It's an amazing thing because we know what Judas does with the money once he gets it. He gets it and he betrays Jesus. He even has to signal by kissing him. And Jesus says, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And they take him away. And Judas then feels terrible about what he did. And the money meant nothing to him now. And he ends up throwing it into the temple. And the priests go, we're not touching that money. That's, that's dirty money. Well, it was the dirty money that you paid to have a man killed. But they said, well, you know, by law, we can't do anything with this money. I can't even go over and pick it up. So we'll give it to a potter and we'll buy his field and we'll bury people like Jesus in the field. It's an amazing thing because... The thing that you get by betraying Jesus is the thing that you won't want at some point. You know what I'm talking about? There are things where we will compromise on Christ and not making him the ruler and king of our heart. And whenever we decide that we're going to step off plan, whatever the thing it is that we step off for, that will become a detestable thing because it costs you your relationship with Christ, your fellowship with Christ. And Gehazi, Gehazi is another one. He's Elijah's superintendent. He's his assistant. And he ends up getting some cash from somebody that comes to him. He ends up getting healed, Naaman. And he does it for money. And he ends up getting stricken with the leprosy that Naaman had because of his greed. And so there are people that are within the realm of religiosity that fall into the category of greed. And some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. I don't want to be one of those number. In verse 7, then came the day of unleavened bread. Actually, there's a week of unleavened bread. Came to the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. And so they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? I understand there's a light on for us somewhere. And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready. 
So they went and found it, just as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. It's kind of a little mysterious passage, isn't it? I, wa I want you to go into the city, and you'll see a guy carrying a pitcher. Okay, probably going to see a lot of guys. I want you to walk out into the road, and you'll see a car coming toward you. Put your hand up and tell them to stop and say, I need a ride. You'll get in. You'll smell cinnamon. I mean, Jesus, what's going on here? You're, you're giving me some pretty exact things going on here, and it turns out exactly like he said. Well, why are we surprised? But can you imagine the guy carrying the pitcher? You're carrying the pitcher, and you're just... You know, you're going about your, your, your work. And by the way, men don't carry pitchers of water. That's women's work. That's like saying, you'll go to the mall. You'll see a man wearing a dress. It's just as weird as that. But it does happen. But can you imagine, can you imagine the stalkers? You, th you think that's him? I don't know. Jesus said we should follow him. All right, let's follow him. And they follow this guy. Can you imagine the guy carrying a pitcher, looking behind him like, what is going on here? Jesus very well could have pre-prepared all this. But how did there happen to be somebody walking by with a pitcher of water at the moment that these guys entered the city? There are no cell phones. There's no satellite. There's nothing that can happen other than God being present with us, who's Jesus himself. And so here comes the guy with the pitcher on his shoulder. Why does Jesus go through all of this trouble and all of this mystery? I don't know if he was just goofing with his disciples, you know. Hey, Dad, watch this. Go into the city, and when you go into the city, you'll see a man carrying a pitcher. When you see him, you follow him, go in where he's going in. That's called trespassing. And the master of the house, make sure you see him and say, hey, where's, where's the room? <laughs> where's the room? And he'll show you. There'll be an upper room. He, he knows exactly where it is. And it's a large upper room where you guys can prepare for this. Why all the intrigue? Because, you see, Jesus is a wanted man. Jesus is being sought to be murdered. And he knows it. And he wants to spend one final night with his disciples and he has a whole bunch that he wants to unload with them in the way of teaching. And he doesn't want anything to come between that. So he's got this little secret thing going on with a guy with a pitcher on his shoulder and his disciples who go out secretly and just kind of follow behind him uh, without probably even having a conversation. And so finally he says, yeah, sure, there's, there's a room upstairs. We'll hook you right up. Are you ready to go on a mission for Jesus? And for your brothers? Does the Lord ever speak to your heart and say, hey, I want you to do this thing? That's kind of weird, Lord. Yeah, I know, but go do it anyway. You ever have the Lord speak to your heart? I, I had somebody call me the other day and said, uh, you know, their name and explain their situation. And I really felt like, I mean, we have a lot of people who call the church here and say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm living in this hotel and that's all that I have. And, um, you know, I don't have any food and I don't have any money and I don't have anything. And I usually ask them, well, how did you get that way? And they avoid all sincerity at that point. And they don't tell you any of the truth of how they got in that situation. And it's, also, it's almost always their own doing. You know, well, don't you have family? Yeah, but they're all terrible. You know. <laughs> all of them? Yeah, I got brothers, I got sisters, I got parents, I've got this. They're all terrible. They're all terrible to me because they won't let me do drugs. But they won't tell you that part. But sometimes the Lord puts on my heart, you know, here's a person who's really in need, like really in need, not due to any of their own stupidity, which is rare, but it does occur. There are people sometimes I've driven by it and the Lord's prompted my heart and said, pull over. People with flat tires. All sorts of things where the Lord speaks to my heart and he directs me to reach out. I don't know about you, but there are also times when the Lord speaks to my heart and he says, I want you to tell this person about me. 
And I'm like, they're going to think I'm a whack job. That's okay. They'll find out soon enough. Just talk to them anyway. Are you ready to go on a mission for Jesus and your brothers? Would you be willing to be one of those disciples to go out on a limb and do what Jesus said? And Jesus said, don't worry about it. I'm with you, even to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus said. So go. Is the Lord speaking to your heart to do something? You should do that because he'll meet you there. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. When he had said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, I've really been looking forward to spending this time with you guys. Can you imagine Jesus saying that to you? I've really been looking forward to spending time with you. That's a pretty cool thing. I wonder if he thinks that every time you go to spend time with him. When you open the word, when you get on your knees, when you come to church. I wonder if he says, you know, I've been looking forward to seeing you. I've been looking forward to spending time with you. I think he does. His hour had finally come. As you read through the scriptures, his hour had not come. And so he was impervious to being arrested or being hurt in any way because his hour had not come. Just like you. You know, Lord has a plan for your life and he has a day to take you home. And until that day, you are like Superman. Because God's got his hand on you. Until he wants you home and then there's no one going to keep you here. By the way, when you think of the Last Supper and Jesus sitting down, you might think of Da Vinci's painting. How many of you think of Da Vinci's painting when I say the Last Supper? Yeah, okay. By the way, they didn't have chairs and a table, and they didn't all sit on one side so they'd all be in the photo. You know, so it, it wasn't quite like that. And by the way, the, the person to Jesus' right is not Mary. That's John. Unless you've seen the Da Vinci Code, and then everything changes. Sorry, if you couldn't hear that, that was me rolling my eyes. Some of you might think of this, but anyway, this, this is the actual identity of all these people in case you cared who were in the picture. Um, this is what it looks like restored. They've been restoring uh, a lot of the, the old art, and so now you look at it and it looks like a, like a lithograph or something contemporary, uh, and there are a lot of people very upset about it, but I'm sorry, I'm distracted. Verse 17, Jesus then took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus knows this is the last time he's going to celebrate Passover. He's celebrated Passover every year since he was a child, I'm sure. But he says, this one's important because this is the last one. And he looked at the wine and by the way, it was wine. It was an alcoholic beverage. I'm just saying. It was springtime, which is when Passover is, and the grapes aren't even, in, aren't even out yet. And so any grape juice that might have gone through the winter and, and the early spring is wine. When Jesus created wine, he created alcoholic beverage. Just thought I'd let you know. But maybe you, like Jesus, say, I will not drink this again until I'm in the kingdom of heaven. And that's okay too. I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And if that's your conviction, praise God. That's okay too. By the way, there were four cups in the Passover meal. The first cup, these, these all come from Exodus 6, verses 6 to 7. The first one is, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's the cup of sanctification. The second cup is judgment. I will rescue you from their bondage. The third cup is redemption. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And the fourth one is, I will take you as my people. These are the four cups in the Passover. 
and you might recognize them. Jesus, by the way, did not drink the last one. He set it aside because that's the cup of joy and that's the one that represents actually everything the way it should be when we actually get to be with him. So that will be the day when Jesus takes of this again. It kind of gives a little bit of significance to when Jesus was in the garden and he prayed, Father, I, if it is possible to let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It's interesting that this happens on the tail end of him going through the cups and putting one aside. And he's saying, this is the one that I don't want to drink. This is the one of his sacrifice. And I don't know what that cup looks like for you, but there may be something that the Lord's asking you to do that you don't want to do. I can tell you it worked out really well for all the rest of us that Jesus did that. Verse 19, and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus takes this Old Testament deliverance from Egypt and he makes it his own. And he says, all of this was done to point to me and this moment. I'm going to create for you a new covenant, a new agreement. And by the way, the agreement goes for all of us who are sinners, which is all of us. And all we have to do is receive it, and we get eternal life just by simply receiving Christ Jesus into our life. We get forgiveness of sins, we get redemption, we get deliverance from the power of sin. All of that because we say yes, and we take that cup that Jesus passes to us. It's by believing in him. And then he makes us new from the inside out. Please, somebody give me an amen. Amen. And we're completely new creatures in Christ Jesus. The old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. And now we have to learn. It's like getting new legs. You got to learn how to use them. And the rest of it's learning. But Jesus says, this is my body. There are some people that believe that Jesus actually, you know, was tearing a piece of his flesh off. It's a metaphor. We understand what a metaphor is, right? If, if you showed me a picture of a friend of yours and you say, this is a friend of mine, I'd say, no, it's not. How can you be friends with a piece of paper? <laughs> it's a metaphor. We understand. This is a picture on some expensive paper that looks like my friend. I understand what that means. Somebody hands me a phone and says, hey, it's your dad. And I say, no, it's not. It's a cell phone. <laughs> we know what a metaphor is. Jesus said, this is my body. And see, when we take communion and we take that, we are asking for Jesus to come into us. We are partaking of his body and all of us together are joining in and saying, I have an allegiance to Jesus Christ. I am in him and he is in me. When we take of the bread and we digest it, it's interesting how you get bread. You have to take wheat and you've got to strip it down and you've got to separate it from the, the chaff, the, the fuzzy things that you can't eat and the, and the covers and you've got to get it down. It's got to be roasted usually in a fire. It gets ground up and it gets made into flour and then it gets mixed with water and it gets pounded out and then you've got bread and then it goes back in the fire and then you have bread. You don't think about the process when you're eating it. But when Jesus said, this is my body, I think of everything his body had to go through to offer it to us as an offering and how he was taken from the earth and he was put through a grinder and he did this all for us. This cup also, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's an interesting thing. Juice or wine is such a great picture because it's the blood of a grape. <laughs> Some grape had to sacrifice his life for you. 
And Jesus said, this is my blood. Now, of course, where was his actual blood? It was in his veins. We're, we're not drinking real blood here, boys and girls. It does not transmutate into anything other than a picture of what Jesus is speaking to us. But if I don't believe that faith alone is going to get me saved, I've got to have some supernatural work. So I guess you need transubstantiation to do that. But you see, the scripture says it's by faith that you're saved. By grace, you're saved through faith. And this isn't of yourself. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. So it's what happens in our heart spiritually before God in communion that really matters. It's not the physical act or else you, you could have the worst person in the world taking communion and it's cool. You know, I'm saved because I ate this little piece of bread that doesn't even have a calorie probably. First Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, Paul writes this and he says, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. It's interesting that Paul, who was a late comer to Jesus Christ, received this from the Lord. The same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember what Jesus did for us as we take communion. And that's the purpose of it. It's to remember. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not one to go back and celebrate all of the feasts in the past, uh, including Passover. I like to celebrate Passover in the new covenant, which is what Jesus left for us. And it's so much more meaningful as we remember his sacrifice and his death on the cross, and as we remember his resurrection, and of course the hope of resurrection for us because we have faith in him. And all of that is the package. This is uh, typically what the bread looks like. You'll notice that it is without yeast because the people of Israel had to leave quickly and they couldn't let their they didn't have enough time to sit around and wait for the bread to rise so they could make pizza or something else. They had to just take off. And so this bread is to be unleavened. Um, it's maybe not the tastiest bread you've ever had. You know, it's not like going to an Italian restaurant and you get warm bread and you dip it in oil. And It's not supposed to be that. It's not a luxurious feast. It's the remembrance that you better hurry up and get the heck out. <laughs> and there's no yeast in it which is yeast is always a symbol of sin and contamination, a perfect picture of the body of Christ. No yeast, no sin taken into me. And if you notice, every single matzah that you will ever see is pierced and striped, just like the body of Jesus Christ, pierced and striped for you. The perfect example. And as the Jews take of this, I, I'm sure they have no clue unless somebody tells them, hey, that middle matzah, you know what that's all about? And explaining all of that to them. What a, what a blessing it is. In John 6, verses 53 to 56, and Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, taken out of context, that sounds like cannibalism. In fact, that was reported in the first century church that everybody in that church is a cannibal. They didn't understand the metaphor. Therefore, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So have you eaten the flesh of Jesus Christ? Have you drank the blood of Jesus Christ? He's not talking about a ceremony. He's talking about accepting him as Lord and Savior into your life as though you had eaten of his flesh. 
and drinking of his blood, remembering his sacrifice for you? Have you given up everything to come to him? That's what Jesus is talking about. It's not because you get a meal and somehow it translates into something else. It's a remembrance and it's a metaphor. We all get that, right? Just, just nod. Okay, that's good. Because if we're in him, then he is in you. And that's the whole point. And as we all eat and as we all drink, it's, we've shared a meal together. All the same parts are all inside of all of us. In verse 21, but behold, the, behand, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the son of man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man in whom he is betrayed. Then he began to question among themselves which one of them it was who would do this thing. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which one of them should be considered the greatest. Wow. Can you imagine the mess at the table? Jesus says, oh, by the way, one of you guys is a spy. Dum, dum, dum. And everybody begins to look around and he goes, listen, it's a terrible thing that's going to happen, but I feel bad for the guy that's going to do it. And of course, spoiler alert, we all know it's Judas, right? Because we, we started reading from the beginning of the chapter and we know it's Judas. Do you know not one of those disciples had any clue it was Judas? They didn't have a clue. John gives us some information John, the apostle, the youngest of all of them, is leaning up against Jesus' breast, and he says, Lord, who is it that betrays you? And nobody else asked Jesus, actually. It was just John. And John got an answer, and no one else did, when they were all guessing and arguing and saying, it's not me. Oh, yeah, it's you. I bet it's you. It's you, isn't it, Thomas? You never have any faith. we got to drag you around everywhere, you know? It's probably Nathaniel. Yeah, let's go die with him. You know, uh, Pick one. Just pick one. It's like if I said one of you, one of you has been talking about me behind my back. <laughs> dum, dum, dum. That's all right. I'm sure you all have. It's okay. My betrayer is with me on the table. So now all the disciples break out in an argument. Is it me? Some of them are saying that. Oh, it's definitely you. What do you mean me? It's not me. They're having this whole argument, and then they get into an argument over who's the greatest. It's like a Three Stooges episode or something. So they go, you know, who knows? They go to blows. Who knows what's going on? But I just think there's Judas, and he's like, uh-oh. He knows. He knows it's me. He knows what I've done. He knows that I've, I've got it in for him. And by the way, Jesus is now going to dip in the, in the cup with him, and he's going to tell John, he says, it's the one who I'm going to dip into the cup with right now. And they take the bread and they dip it, and there was no laws against double dipping either. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> and so they dip into the cup at the same time, and Jesus' eyes meet Judas's, and he says, what you're about to do, do it quickly. And Judas up and goes, and he leaves. And all the disciples are like looking at each other, like, what, what's up with that? But they reasoned within themselves, well, he's the guy who holds the money, so he's probably doing, he's on an errand for Jesus. Jesus told him to go do something and do it quickly, so he's probably on an errand for Jesus. No one had a clue that it was Judas. That's how good deceivers can be. That's how slick wolves in sheep's clothing can be. So keep your eyes open. And what he had to look forward to was a noose. If you remember, in desperation, he went and hung himself. And I love one of the Gospels that tells us that all of his guts gushed out. Don't know how that happened or how long he had been hanging there until that happened. It may have been because of the Passover, nobody wanted to touch him. And he may have bloated up hanging there on the tree. 
Whenever we betray Jesus for any reason, we will despise the fact that we did it later. So I wonder if Jesus had to straighten these guys out, put on the gloves, you know, get between them, or, you know, I just wonder, or if he just sat there and kind of let it go about its way until he could get their attention. Or maybe he'll do a little like Dave Loyally does. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> you, 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 I'm talking to you, you. He's so subtle. I love that brother. I don't think he did that. That almost sounded like Joe Pesci though, right? Hey, hey, hey. It sounded like Joe, Joe Pesci. Anyway. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul is reminding this young pastor, Titus, he says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, speaking of the church, to obey, to be ready for every good work, and catch this, to speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. I guess the disciples didn't get that. They didn't get the memo yet. Paul wasn't even saved yet. We're going to leave it right there with Judas and the disciples arguing over who's the greatest, over this wonderful sacred meal, and Jesus is trying to impart truth to them. He says, one of you is a betrayer. One of you is a spy. And then they went wild. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and as they do, I'd like you guys to really think about what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be in him. Have you taken him into your life like Jesus says? Is he your life like your food? Is he the one who you've given everything to? He certainly is deserving. He's deserving of all of us. Pray with me. Father, I pray that you help us to give you all of ourselves. Even, Lord Jesus, as you gave all for us, that we would give all for you. That we would walk according to your will, that we would be in you, and that you might light a flame in our hearts so that you might captivate our will and our attention and our imagination for you. Help us to live for you while we may, in Jesus' name.